The Washington State Department of Natural Resources is steward of more than 2.6 million acres of aquatic lands, lands of navigable lakes, rivers, the coast, and lands submerged under Puget Sound. The DNR Aquatic Reserves Program protects aquatic lands that are of environmental, scientific, or educational interest by partnering with numerous stakeholders in fostering citizen science and public involvement long-term management plans for these important aquatic areas are implemented. In 2010, these 36,000 acres of aquatic lands received their reserve designation from the Department of Natural Resources. Smith and Minor Islands are surrounded by 30,000 acres of beautiful oceanscapes and houses a unique and diverse aquatic environment with some of the most abundant kelp beds in Puget Sound. In this incredible ecosystem, unique species, as strange as anything from science fiction, create a complex web of diversity. In this complex ecosystem, amidst a constant snowfall of organic debris, life abounds. At the center of the aquatic reserve, just off the coast of Smith Island, exists the largest bull kelp bed in Puget Sound. But these prolific and beautiful plants are just the visible indicator of the hundreds of species that find their home here in the Smith and Minor Reserve. I'm Tom Mumford, and I work for the Department of Natural Resources, and I am the I'm head science advisor now for the Aquatics Resources Division within the Department of Natural Resources. The thing that's unique about this particular reserve is that it's going to protect or uh, give some offer of protection to a fairly unique habitat. And these are these shallow banks that are within the photic zone. In other words, there's seaweed and seagrasses growing on the top of these things. They're only 30, 40 feet deep. The at one time, I think everybody was thinking that the greatest threat was probably people building docks over the top of eel grass, or dredging, or harvesting, and so forth. And recently, I've become much more convinced that probably the greatest threat in Puget Sound is going to be water quality. In areas that have degraded water quality, you begin to see a decline in eel grass, you begin to see a decline in bull kelp, for instance. Bull kelp is a species that is an annual, so what you see plant that comes up, comes up every spring, and so it makes a lot of, fixes a lot of carbon, puts a lot of carbon into the detritus food web, and so it's very important as a source of food for all kinds of organisms, and it also, because of its, it floats up to the surface and then goes out, it is also very important habitat. So it's important not only from a productivity standpoint, it's, it's also a habitat, a structural habitat. 
salmon orient themselves, incoming salmon orient themselves to kelp beds very nicely. But people know about it. People care about it. They look at it and they're going, and the kayakers all know about it. And any fisherman in Puget Sound will be the first person to call you up and say, the kelp's gone and my fishing is gone. The Zoster Marina is the one that you find um, around a great deal of the Puget Sound, except for the very southern end of the Sound. And it's important for a variety of reasons. One, it produces a lot of food. Um, it, it, it's a plant, so it's constantly sloughing off material that goes into the detrital food web. It's an important food for brant. Brant, when they migrate through here, almost exclusively eat real grass. And, but probably more importantly, it's a structural habitat. So the blades are all sticking up, and there's all kinds of juvenile fish that either lay their eggs there, or the, the juvenile larval fish spend a great deal of their time in your grass beds. Crab spend a lot of time in your grass beds. So it's important for many of the fisheries here in Puget Sound. The other thing that it does, it stabilizes the bottom. It's kind of like having a carpet on the mud. And so the mud stays put and doesn't stir up and get muddy or get transported away and erode away. The, the iridescent algae that you see looks like a dish rag, maybe this big or this big. And it has, looks like it has an oil sheen, like this glistening purple uh, iridescence on the surface of it. The name used to be called Iridea, which was a wonderful name. And more recently, the taxonomist decided it really would be called Maziella, which doesn't quite catch it as much as the Iridea does. It's an interesting seaweed in a couple of ways. First of all, that iridescence is, it's a, got a cuticle, a layer on the outside of the plant itself that consists of many layers of alternating proteins, carbohydrate, protein, carbohydrates, that are spaced just right so it acts like a, a soap film, uh, you know, like an oil film, just that right thickness. So the light, it makes an interference filter well, the feather boa kelp is, a, is one that, it's a large kelp, I mean, large kelp. So you have a, a big, gnarly hold fast, but, but these happy, it glues it to the bottom, right? And it sticks up, and you've got these long strips that stick out 15, 20 feet in some cases, and there's little floats that come off, so at high tide, it floats up and will be nearer to the surface. It's interesting because it tends to move and flop back and forth and the high it tends to grow in very high wave energy places. And this thing is able to withstand an enormous amount of um, whipping back and forth and stretching and jerking and so forth. It's a, it's a tough plant. Well, the thing that I think, we, the, the opportunity that we have with the Smith Island protection, there are, are over 600 kinds of seaweed in the state of Washington. The, the biodiversity is really high in the state of Washington compared to almost anywhere else in the world. This reserve is going to begin to put on the map the fact that there is good algal biodiversity in the state. This is one of the areas of high biodiversity in the algal world, and we're going to do something about it. We're recognize it, we're going to protect it. Well, I go back to the theory that really there's nothing wrong with the animal life, there's nothing wrong with the eelgrass or the seaweeds. The problem is people, of course, and how do you, to protect them, you have to change people's behavior. And so that, that to me is one aspect of citizen science. You get people caring about it. So another aspect of citizen science is the fact that a specialist like me um, can't be everywhere all the time. And if I can get other people excited about and learning about some of the things about seaweed, for instance, or seagrasses that I'm interested in, then I've got a hundred eyes or more and ears out there looking at and thinking about these things. And will call me up. And I don't get to Marison Island very often, but somebody will call me up and say, Tom, there's no kelp this year on Marison. That's the value of citizen science. So you have observers, you have people that care, change behavior, and people that are in touch with their environment. That's really what it's all about.